Good day, everyone. On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia Series and our sponsor, Biomodels LLC, I'd like to welcome you to Preclinical Mouse Models of Pulmonary Disease, Acute Lung Injury, Acute and Severe Asthma, and Pulmonary Fibrosis. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and moderator for today's event. I'd like to introduce our presenter for today. He is Andrew W. Borkowski, PhD, Scientist 2 with Biomodels LLC. Welcome, Dr. Borkowski. The presenter ball is yours. Thanks, Elizabeth, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone in attendance today. As Elizabeth mentioned, we'll be going through a number of preclinical disease models for pulmonary disease today. I'd first like to introduce our company, Biomodels. We are a preclinical contract research organization based out of Watertown, Mass., which is just outside of Boston, founded in 1997 out of the Brigham's and Women's Hospital, and have grown pretty steadily over the last 20-some-odd years. We focus on highly translational models of human disease and conditions for a wide variety of clients. Well, today we'll present a number of templated disease models. We're happy to work with clients to kind of optimize these models to fit the needs of the client. We have therapeutic expertise in a number of different indications. We have a number of experts here in inflammation and autoimmunity. We have the ability to run a number of microbiome studies with dedicated germ-free isolators for running germ-free and defined microbiome studies. We have a number of oncology models. Additionally, we have pulmonary disease models, which I'll uh, go over today. And additionally, fibrosis, uh, metabolic disorder models, as well as neurology and psychiatric disorder models, uh, in addition to cancer supportive care models. And we're happy to report that as of today, we've facilitated over 50 compounds into clinical trials in multiple indications. Today's webinar will be laid out initially as a review of some of the pulmonary diseases viewing the kind of the economic impact and morbidity and mortality of these diseases. I will then review some of the pulmonary disease model endpoints that are often looked at in the clinic, as well as assessed in the disease models, and then go over a number of pulmonary disease models that are offered at biomodels, including acute lung injury, asthma, pulmonary fibrosis, as well as an in vitro fibrosis model for screening drugs. As a, as a brief intro to pulmonary disease, it has a huge impact in the world. It's the third leading cause of death and fourth in the U.S. And some of the diseases that we'll, we're referring to are chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, adult respiratory distress syndrome, is ARDS, asthma, as well as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And while a number of treatments currently exist for these diseases, there is always a need for better treatments and cures remain in high demand. So I'd like to just review some of the epidemiology as well as the kind of economic uh, and burdens to public health that these diseases present. So COPD, we have about 16 million cases in the U.S. alone, with 65 million worldwide. It's reported that there's up to 3 million deaths per year due to this disease. And it's been found that the rates of COPD are continuing to increase, with patient care costs expected to rise above $50 billion by 2020. Uh, another disease, acute respiratory distress syndrome, Shows about 200,000 cases annually in the U.S. with 2.2 million worldwide, and a 30-35% mortality rate is observed with this disease. Another disease that has quite a burden on public health is asthma, with 25 million cases in the U.S. and 300 worldwide, 300 million worldwide. It's been seen that 15 million disability-adjusted life years are lost, and over 250,000 asthma deaths are reported worldwide annually. And this also poses a large economic burden with over $50 billion spent annually in the U.S. on asthma-related costs alone. And then finally, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. There's about 100,000 cases reported in the U.S., with 30 to 40,000 cases each year. There is a low survival with this, with three to five-year survival after diagnosis, with $3 billion in direct patient costs alone. So as you can see, that pulmonary disease is a very disruptive and uh, disruptive burden on public health. So. Here at Biomodels, our goal is to provide translational models to our clients. So there's a number of criteria that these models should fit when we're trying to model and treat a disease, these preclinical disease models. First and foremost, we want the model to replicate the clinical condition. And then we'd like to see that the underlying biology should be the same or very similar to the 
human disease or the pathology that's seen in human disease. And ideally, these models are cost effective and can provide actionable information so that we can assess the, the treatments in an efficient way. Finally, we like to see that the endpoints should be translatable to those used in clinical trials. So there's a number of clinical endpoints that are often assessed in pulmonary disease, and these are pretty common to the diseases that I had previously mentioned, one being biomarkers, and these are assessed in both sputum and serum, as well as in tissue. So one thing that will often be looked at is the type of the inflammatory cell in this fluid or tissue, as well as inflammatory mediators, such as cytokines. Something else that is looked at is lung function, and there's a number of different components of lung function that can be measured, including forced expiratory volume, forced vital capacity, airway resistance, lung compliance, and a number of other measures of lung function. Additionally, exercise tests are, are used to assess the lung function as well, such as the six-minute walk test or an endurance test. And so we have a number of ways of assessing all of these components within the disease models that we offer. So first and foremost, we're looking, often looking at a number of different biomarkers, pulmonary disease models, one being within the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. And so in order to gain access to this, first we will tracheatomize the lung. The lung is then washed out with PBS, collected, then spun down. And that gives us the ability to look at both total cell counts as well as differential cell counts, including macrophages, eosinophils, neutrophils, and lymphocytes. And here to the right, we can see under the heading bowel cells in a naive normal mouse. You don't normally see too many cells. The cells that are seen are primarily macrophages, and that's normal in the normal bowel condition. If you then look at the picture under LPS. This is an acute lung injury model in which LPS was administered to the animals two days prior to taking the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. As you can see here, you see a lot more cells as well as the majority of the cell type here is neutrophil. And so this is what defines the inflammatory components of this disease model. In addition to looking at the cells within the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, we can look at different inflammatory mediators or total protein in the supernatant of that component. And those are also very indicative of disease, and we'll show some more specific data related to that in the, in the specific disease models. So in addition to the, the bowel fluid, we often look at circulating cytokines within serum or cytokines or other markers within lung homogenate. And that can be a wide, wide variety of different commercially available kits to assess that. Another big assessment of disease is done through histology. And so when we collect lungs at the end of a study, the lungs will often be insufflated in formalin, embedded in paraffin, and then sectioned. And then we have the ability to stain with a number of different histological stains, one being a hematoxylin eosin stain to assess general morphology as well as Inflammation, and with that stain, we can we can gain a lot of information about cell types that have that are being found within the lungs. Additionally, we can stain with Mason's trichrome, which will look at levels of fibrosis and collagen deposition. Additionally, we can use a picocerius red stain for quantifying our levels of fibrosis. And then in asthma models, we'll often stain with the PAS, which will look at mucus and assess levels of goblet cell hyperplasia, and then. If there's a more specific marker that's of interest, we can always perform a immunohistochemical stain to assess levels of that marker in disease or non-disease states. And so uh, this picture here at the bottom is, is showing lungs from both naive and animals that were administered bleomycin in the pulmonary fibrosis model. So while in the naive animal, you see nice, healthy alveoli, a lot of open space, you see in the bleomycin-administered lung that a lot of the lung architecture has been obliterated and overtaken by the fibrotic material. So something else that we assess and then disease model is, is lung function. So we have a device here known as the FlexEvent, which is a mechanical ventilator. The terminal procedure that's performed at the end of these disease models, the mice are anesthetized, tracheotomized, and attached to this ventilator. 
and this allows for the ventilation of the mouse and forced oscillations. And using this device, we're able to generate pressure volume curves, broadband forced oscillation, and in assessing hyperreactive hyper airways, we can nebulize methacholine and assess airway hyperreactivity. This is one of the pieces of data that we will get from the, the flex event, the pressure volume curve. And so in this process, the flex event will apply quasi-static increases in lung volume at the airway opening and are able to measure lung volume as a result. So we are showing data here from a bleomycin-induced pulmonary fibrosis model. And the, the black line here is, for, is from a naive animal. So here we have the inspirational curve here, and then the expirational curve here, part of the curve here. As increased amounts of pressure are applied using this machine, we see the, res, uh, the resultants increase in volume of the lung. And then as the, the pressure is taken away, you then see kind of the stepwise decrease in volume again. In the bleomycin-administered lungs and in the pulmonary fibrosis animals, see that the same increase in pressure is not met with the same increase in volume. So you see a smaller volume associated with the similar pressure, and that's indicative of stiffening lungs caused by the, the fibrosis. And this is often seen in inflamed lungs as well. So we'll see a shift down into the right in a, a less functional lung. And so by performing these pressure volume curves and applying this data to a number of different formulas, you can take out a lot of relevant data, including things like lung compliance and elastins, tissue elastins and tissue damping, vital capacity, as well as work of breathing is, are just a few of the, the many components that come out of this readout. Additionally, we have the ability to administer different levels of methacholine in order to look at hyper-responsive airways. So the data in this slide is from an asthma model. And here we first administer saline and take a number of measurements over three minutes. Twelve measurements are taken total. Well, after that three-minute period, we then start administering increasing levels of methacholine. And as you can see, airway resistance will increase and somewhat normalize. And then as you get into the higher doses of methacholine, you're seeing pretty substantial increases in airway resistance. And this is indicative of a hyper-responsive airway. So we see kind of a lower response in naive animals and a much higher response in the diseased animals. And this, in this case, it's an OVA-induced asthma model. And then I'll show this data again when I talk about, more specifically talk about the asthma models, but in the positive control used with dexamethasone, we see some alleviation of this airway resistance. And so this can be represented as both area under the curve or max response, as we don't always see the same shape of the curve, but both of these readouts will give you an indication of the airway hyper-responsiveness. And then finally, another method of looking kind of how the animals are affected with these different pulmonary diseases is uh, endurance testing. So we have uh, special cages set up to monitor wheel running, and a reduction in wheel running reflects fatigue, which is also indicative of uh, lessened lung function. And this is a surrogate for the six-minute walk or endurance test that's done in the clinic. The data that we're showing here is from a, a radiation-induced pulmonary fibrosis model. So early in this model, we do not see histologically many changes or the biomarker changes are not as obvious, but we are able to measure kind of a difference in endurance testing. So now I'm going to start talking about some of the more specific models and kind of the timelines and specific data for those models. And so the first model I'll be talking about today is an acute lung injury model. And this is often used for modeling ARDS as well as COPD. So acute lung injury is characterized by hypoxemia, pulmonary edema, low lung compliance, and widespread capillary leakage. And the causes of this can be from pneumonia, sepsis, aspiration, or trauma. And in humans, it usually requires mechanical ventilation, which can also increase the risk of uh, this injury. So we offer two different types of acute lung injury models, one being induced by hydrochloric acid and another being induced by LTS administration. In the hydrochloric acid installation model, we will administer hydrochloric acid of 0.1 normal at specific volumes and then look at some of the different endpoints between 1 and 96 hours after that administration. 
It's an LPS induced lung injury. Um, it's usually an intranasal administration, but we've done intratracheal as well. It's LPS, which is a TLR4 agonist, and it's more specific for the acute immune response seen acute lung injury. And this can be monitored over a course of hours to, to many days out more, but we see kind of a peak response around two days, and I'll explain that a little more when I get to that specific model. And so some of the endpoints that we look at here, which I reviewed previously, are looking at the, the bowel fluid and looking at the cell types, as well as total cells, then looking at lung mechanics, and as well as the pathology and bowel inflammatory content, and then it's possible to look at serum markers or any other tissues that you may think are important for disease. When applying treatments for this disease model, can be done through a number of different routes, intranasal, intratracheal. The drug can be nebulized, injected intravenously, subcutaneously, intraperitoneally, or given by oral gavage, and we're kind of also open to any, any new routes of treatment that you think may be relevant for disease. So in terms of nebulization, we're unique in that we have a, a nose-only tower for, for doing a nose-only dosing. A lot of the time with aerosolized dosing, animals will be dosed inside a box, and a lot of the drug may just accumulate on the animal and be ingested during cleaning. With this nose-only tower, we can focus the, the dosing more to the airways. And the other benefits that this include are low internal volume. There's a very small internal diameters in, in the, the dosing capsules, and this is very nice for if the, uh, the drug is limited. So what we basically have here is a nebulizer that gets hooked up on top. It nebulizes through the device, and there's tw up to 12 openings here to, to be dosing mice uh, up to 12 at a time. As you can see here, these mice are held in soft restraints, and their nose is able to enter the channel. And there's a unique channel for each of the 12 places, so this prevents rebreathing and cross-contamination. So this is something that's very nice for doing uh, kind of topical lung dosing. So now getting more specifically into the disease models, kind of talk about the timeline and show some of the data from the models. Uh, and this HCL-induced acute lung injury model will administer the, the HCL intratracheally. And then 24 hours later, or whatever time point it's decided for the study, we'll, we'll then collect bowel fluid, uh, the lungs, as well as doing uh, the lung mechanics measurements. And as you can see here, this is data from uh, bowel fluid. If you look at the total inflammatory cells, so we had four groups here, each administered different volumes of HCL. And you can see a dose-dependent response um, with increasing amounts of HCL translating to a larger inflammatory cell component. And as you can see, this is dominated by uh, the neutrophil response. And we'll also see the same trend here with total protein. And this increase in total protein reflects the leakage of plasma proteins into the alveolar space, which directly correlates with pulmonary edema. Looking at the lung function readouts, you can see with increasing amounts of HCL that this pressure volume curve shifts more to the right. Uh, which indicates uh, stiffening lungs. And here, the lung elastance readouts uh, show that quite clearly. So the other uh, acute lung injury model that we offer uh, is an LPS-induced model. You all probably know LPS is an endotoxin present on the outer membrane of a number of gram-negative uh, bacteria because it's TLR4-dependent inflammation and serves uh, as a uh, good mimicry of the host innate immune response. Um, and this is a model that we often use uh, an acute screen for COPD. In the validation study, I'm going to show slides from uh, after this. We introduced uh, LPS intranasally to mice and looked at different endpoints at 4, 24, 48, and 72 hours. And we again assessed bowel fluid, lung elastins, and airway hyperactivity, uh, as well as histology to assess disease. So as you can see here, First, looking at inflammatory cells, that the longer you wait, the more inflammatory cells you see up until about 48 hours. And then we start seeing a bit of a taper off here at 72 hours. Uh, the same trend is seen with neutrophils. 
And then as well, a uh, similar trend is seen with an uh, inflammatory cytokine that was measured in the bowel fluid. Um, so in general, we basically see a kind of peak response in terms of inflammation in the lungs around 48 hours, and after that, uh, a bit of tapering. And one thing that I forgot to mention was that in this model, we titrate every uh, lot of LPS that we're using, and that way we, we don't see lots of lot differences in the disease model. Um, and as you can see, just from the simple histo histological readout, that we see dose-dependent inflammation within the lung uh, by histology readout. Now we're here on this slide looking at the lung mechanics. And again, you're going to notice that this, in the mice that were, that had LPS introduced, that these uh, pressure volume curves are shifting uh, to the right and downward, indicating stiffening of the lungs. And by 72 hours, you're seeing that the diseased animals showing a little less stiffening. So, and this is also picked up by looking at the, the lung of last and readout. So I showed that 48 hours was kind of the optimal time to look at levels of peak inflammation. Uh, I want to next show that dexamethasone serves as a, a, nice, a nice control in this model. So dexamethasone is usually administered just prior to the LPS, and then usually every 24 hours uh, up until the, the, end point, the day before the endpoints. So here you'll, we're looking at bowel fluid again, uh, looking at neutrophils and some inflammatory cytokines, um, and while LPS causes significant increases in neutrophils, treatment with dexamethasone, uh, you see a significant decrease. And the same trend is seen in both uh, IL-6 as well as IL-1 beta uh, in the supernatant of the bowel. And you'll also see here that uh, when dexamethasone is used to treat disease, we see much less inflammation histologically as well. Next, looking at some lung mechanics, uh, we see that the elastins increase uh, with LPS is then diminished when treated with dexamethasone. And again, you see, in looking at the pressure volume curves, that treatment with dexamethasone almost completely ameliorates the, the, the stiffening of the lungs that's, that's observed. So in summary of the uh, acute lung injury models, we validated two clin clinically relevant models, one being the HCL-induced model, uh, which replicates more so the necrotic insult to the pulmonary epithelium that occurs during inhalation and toxicities, uh, aspiration of stomach contents, as well as the LPS model, which, which simulates more so the innate immune responses uh, following pneumonia or sepsis. We were able to characterize these models in regards to inflammation, whether seen uh, in bowel fluid and cell type, as well as histologically and also shown that uh, lung mechanics are affected in this model. Finally, we're able to show that dexamethasone serves as a reproducible positive control and can be compared to other anti-inflammatory compounds in this model. I'm next gonna move on to talk about asthma and some of the, the different asthma models that are offered at Biomodels. So human asthma is a disease characterized by Th2 inflammation. There's a reversible airway narrowing um, or hyper-responsive airwaves, and some remodeling can occur in the asthmatic airway. As I mentioned previously, there's 25 million cases in the U.S. alone, um, with greater than 50 billion in healthcare costs uh, because of this disease. While well, a number of treatments exist for asthma and low-dose anti-inflammatory compounds in the uh, case of inhaled corticosteroids, uh, long-acting bronchodilators can be effective. There's a population of about 10% of asthmatics that don't respond well to this. We also offer a model for severe asthma that mimics this population. And in the severe asthma population, we see more of a Th1, Th2 mixed uh, profile rather than the more Th2-related uh, disease that's seen in more of the acute models. So these are the three kind of major induction paradigms that we're, we're using for the, the asthma models, uh, one being ovalbumin, and this is one of the most widely used models and probably most well-published model. And then we also offer models in, that are induced by house dust mite allergen as well as cockroach allergen. These are considered more clinically relevant both based on the allergen and the route of exposure. So we'll look at a, a number of similar endpoints that we had looked at in the acute lung injury model, and I'm going to go through these models uh, in the next few slides. So with the OVA-induced asthma model, 
will sensitize with ovalbumin as well as an adjuvant, uh, which is uh, alum in this model. They're given an IP injection on day zero and seven, and then an intranasal challenge of just ova on days 13, 14, and 15, and followed by uh, collections and assessment of different endpoints at day 16. So again, we'll be looking at bowel fluid for total and differential counts, as well as inflammatory mediator analysis. We'll collect the lungs and look histologically for both changes in architecture, inflammatory cell components, as well as mucus production. And then with the asthma, we'll look at airway hyperactivity by the, the methylcholine challenge uh, using the FlexBin. So first looking at the bowel fluid, uh, we see that there's gonna be an increase in total inflammatory cells as well as eosinophils. And we do see some dose-dependent increases in these, these cells um, if the amount of OVA is is, is increased. And we also show that dexamethasone, which is a positive control used for this, this model, we can see significant decreases in the inflammatory components in the bowel fluid. Uh, additionally, if you look at the histology uh, uh, components below, we see increases in inflammatory cells in the bowel, or sorry, in the histological sections treated with OVA, but then when dexamethasone is, is also treated, we see reductions in inflammation. And this is similar to the slide that I presented previously, but in this slide, we're administering different levels of methacholine to demonstrate uh, airway hyper-responsiveness. And you can see that if you look at the airway resistance graph here, at high doses of methacholine, we see large increases in airway resistance as well as tissue elastins uh, in the diseased animals. And then when treated with dexamethasone, see an alleviation of this airway resistance as well as the, the tissue elastins. I'm going to talk a bit more about the hus house dust mite uh, induced uh, asthma model. And so in this model, uh, we again uh, do a sensitization on day zero and seven, uh, but in contrast to the OVA model, this is done as an intranasal induction. And there is no adjuvant given in this model as well. We're then challenging the animals intranasally on day 14 and collecting tissues for endpoint analysis on day 15. Um, and there's a couple different positive control compounds that we've validated in this model, including dexamethasone as well as fludigazone propionate. And these can be given kind of in different schedules uh, to show similar results. So first, looking at the bowel fluid, again, we're seeing significant increases in total inflammatory cells, the eosinophils, as well as neutrophils here as well. And then treatment with dexamethasone, we see decreases on these inflammatory cell components. Um, and this is also seen in total inflammatory cells with fluticasone. Looking histologically, by both H and E stain as well as the PS stain, which looks at uh, goblet hypoplasia and indicative of excessive mucus production. And we see that in this HDM model, we see large increases in inflammatory cells within the alveolar spaces uh, as well as in surrounding vessels. And then in, with the PS stain, we're able to observe uh, moderate numbers of PS positive goblet cells indicative of increased mucus production. Looking more specifically at cytokines, we see significant increases in IL-4, IL-5, IL-6, all TH2 uh, inflammatory mediators, but don't see much change in TH1-related uh, cytokines. When treated as well with buticasone or dexamethasone, see significant drops in these levels of cytokines. Looking at the functional measurements of the lung here, showing area resistance, well, with the high dose of methacholine, we see a large difference between the naive and vehicle-treated uh, animals. We see some alleviation of the, of the disease with both fluticasone as well as dexamethasone. And so uh, this last model of asthma that I'll show some data for is a severe model of asthma. So this is a corticosteroid-resistant model. And in this model, we see a little bit more robust disease, generally a little bit more inflammation and decreased lung function. And so the difference here is that rather than an intranasal 
uh, sensitization. There's a subcutaneous sensitization, and then this sensitization will include a uh, complete Freund's adjuvant as an adjuvant for the model. Animals will then be challenged intranasally with HDM on day 14, and levels of inflammation and levels of disease will be assessed on day 16. So again, we see looking at the, the bowel cells that we see significant increases in total cell numbers, eosinophils as well as neutrophils. As we had mentioned, there's this kind of a mixed TH1-2 response with both eosinophils and neutrophils playing a large component of the disease. Here looking at histologically at H&E and PS stains, we see increases uh, in the levels of inflammatory cells as well as uh, PS positive goblet cells. And then looking specifically at the TH1 and TH2 cytokines, we're now seeing increases in both uh, the TH1 and TH2 cytokines. And finally, looking at functionally, we're seeing increases in airway resistance following high doses of uh, methacholine administration, demonstrating the airway hyperresponsiveness in this model as well. So in summary, we have validated a number of allergic asthma models, a couple of acute models, one with OVA being the most traditional and primarily eosinophilic, and it's the most well-characterized model in the literature. Um, and additionally, we have an HDM as well as a cockroach allergen models that are more physiologically relevant, and they do not require adjuvants. There's a bit more neutrophilic inflammation present in these models, and we're able to show that dexamethasone and fluticasone uh, serve as reliable positive controls. Additionally, we have a model of severe asthma that has a mixed TH1-2 profile in the, in, uh, in the cytokines, and the inflammation is both eosinophilic and neutrophilic. Airways are hyper-responsive, and there's a, a corticosteroid insensitivity seen in this model as well. And so while these are kind of templated models of acute asthma, we can also modify the duration and sensitization challenge schedules uh, to fit therapeutic applications, uh, as well as carry out more chronic models that last over a period of months. Finally, I'm going to talk about pulmonary fibrosis um, and a couple of the pulmonary fibrosis models that we offer at Biomodels. Pulmonary fibrosis is a progressive fatal lung disease, which is characterized by lung damage and scar tissue formation, uh, often seen as honeycombing on a number of visual readouts. As a result, these lungs become very stiff, and the effects seen here are usually irreversible, irreversible um, and lead to loss of lung f function and ultimately uh, in death. While this disease is largely idiopathic in nature, uh, there's a number of risk factors that have been identified, including uh, smoking, radiation therapy, as well as other diseases that might occur in the lungs, including acute lung injury and ARDS. As I said previously, there's about 100,000 people in the U.S. each year. Mean survival of 4.2 years with 30 to 40,000 new cases diagnosed each year. There have been a couple of treatments that have been approved for this disease, including perfenidone and nintanidib, and these are some of the clinical comparators that we'll, we'll use in the disease model as well. Uh, so the pulmonary fibrosis disease model is mediated largely by that TGF beta pathway and the, the damage that is occurring in the lungs leads to myofibroblast activation and proliferation, ultimately leading, leading to collagen deposition and fibrosis uh, as well as tissue destruction. And so a lot of the treatments will uh, target these, these pathways. And so we have a number of different versions of the pulmonary fibrosis model here. Two of these models involve the administration of bleomycin, one through the intratracheal route and the other uh, by an osmotic pump. And then another model that runs a bit longer is a radiation-induced pulmonary fibrosis model and can take anywhere from four to six months uh, to see fibrosis development. So, as I mentioned briefly before, some of the endurance testing uh, that we offer can kind of pick up changes uh, earlier on. The IT bleo model runs 21 days, and the osmotic pump model runs about 28 days, and I'm going to go through some of the data, uh, the validation of these models as well. So first, uh, just going to review the intratracheal uh, bleomycin-induced pulmonary fibrosis model. On day zero, 
bleomycin is administered intratracheally, and then we do the endpoints and disease assessment on day 21. Um, body weights and respiratory status are monitored throughout, and fibrosis can be detected earlier than day 21, but generally we will look at day 21 for a majority of the endpoints. Each time we validate uh, this model, we will make sure that the, the lot of bleomycin we have is responding with similar pathology, uh, as we've seen that different doses in different lots may, may look a little bit different. But some of the things that we'll look at are weight loss, long weight, as well as Ashcroft score, um, which I'll describe a little bit more. Um, so in the, the graphs here that I'm presenting, uh, we have administered different doses of bleomycin uh, and kind of look at the changes in weight and changes in uh, lung weight uh, at sacrifice. So we don't always see a dose-dependent response with bleomycin, so it's important to kind of tailor the exact dose that will give a, a similar response from, from bleomycin lot to lot. But in general, we, gen we see kind of a characteristic weight loss till about day seven and then an increase in weight till uh, the end of the study. And this kind of, this coincides kind of with the inflammatory and fibrosis development within the model, which can be seen as early as day seven, but generally at the time when treatments will either begin uh, around day zero or around day seven. And as you can see here in the wet lung weight, that we see increases which are indicative uh, kind of an early readout of fibrosis. So one of the primary endpoints in assessing disease and pulmonary fibrosis includes the Ashcroft score. And so this is done uh, based on histological readouts and basically is a summary of the levels of fibrosis that are observed in the lung tissue. So um, when we are developing a model, we focus our efforts in trying to have a disease model with a disease uh, severe enough uh, to show changes, but also not too severe as that um, we cannot see any type of uh, interventional treatment uh, showing a nice effect. So we're generally focusing on an Ashcroft score of about three and a half to four, but we definitely see certain parts of the lung that reach higher scores, five or six. Um, but in general, we're, we're targeting around an Ashcroft score of three and a half to four uh, during the disease model development and bleomycin uh, validation. So here we're showing the modified Ashcroft score in this validation study. And as you can see, when bleomycin of 1.5 units per kg was administered, we're seeing around the disease level that we're, we're targeting. And as you can see here, histologically, um, build up of a lot of fibrosis uh, in the bleomycin administered lungs, and some areas are almost completely obliterated, uh, while there are other components that look normal. And so lung collagen content is something else that we'll measure within these lungs, usually using a hydroxyproline assay. And as you can see here, we're seeing more of a dose response as bleomycin increases, but the highest levels are seen around 1.5 to 2, 2.5 units per kg of bleomycin. So some of the clinical comparators that we'll use uh, in these models include drugs that have been uh, approved for treating IPF, one being perfenadone and another being mentenanib. And it's been seen that a number of anti-TGF beta antibodies are under development, something that we've tested in the model as well. When treating in this model, we'll generally treat prophylactically, um, but we have also seen promising results treating up to day seven, and we'll assess a number of the similar endpoints uh, with these treatments. So if you look here, just at weight loss initially, you can see that in the disease control, kind of a typical weight loss and recovery, you see a little bit of a benefit to the, both the TGF beta and perfenadone treatments in the weight loss. Histologically, you see a huge change in this, in this figure. We have large areas of uh, fibrotic lung tissue in the disease control in animals, but much less fibrosis observed in both the anti-GF beta treatment 
and, per, and per, with the profenadone treatment. Additionally, we can see changes in lung function with these treatments. So as you see with bleomycin, a shift down into the right. And then with the anti tdf beta treatment, we see an almost complete overlie of the naive animals, which makes it look like these animals are showing no decrease in lung function. And we see a very similar response here with profenadone. So these uh, treatments work very well to help lung function. Looking at the modified Ashcroft score as a result of these treatments, you can see significant increases initially with the BLEO administration, then significant decreases with these two treatments. We also see decreases in the percent of the lung that's affected by fibrosis, as well as changes in collagen content through this hydroxyproline assay. Functionally, you see increases in lung elastins and then decreases with these treatments, as well as improvements in vital capacity, as well as work of breathing with these treatments. So the next model I'll review some data for is the osmotic pump in, uh, administered bleomycin. So in this model, bleomycin is loaded into this, this capsule, slowly infuses the bleomycin over 28 days. Uh, this is implanted under the back skin of the mouse. And in addition to the causing pulmonary fibrosis, we're also seeing levels of dermal fibrosis in this animal as well. But I will not be presenting any of that data today. We see in this model dose-dependent decreases in weight loss as well as dose-dependent increases in lung weight, which is indicative of uh, early indications of fibrosis. Histologically, seeing changes uh, just dependent changes in the levels of fibrosis uh, as you increase the levels of bleomycin, and this correlates quite well with the with Ashcroft scores as well as collagen severity scores. Looking at the bowel fluid, we see increases in total cells as well as total and um, percent of neutrophils. And then functionally, we're seeing shifts of the PV curves, uh, decreased inspiratory capacity, increased resistance, increased elastins as well as increased tissue elastins um, as you increase the levels of bleomycin that are administered. Finally, I'm going to talk about human in vitro model of pulmonary fibrosis, and this is a, uh, a tool that's used for screening uh, compounds that may then be decided to be moved into some of the in vivo uh, models. In this model, we use normal human lung fibroblasts, which are plated overnight in serum-free media, and then to induce fibrosis, their uh, CGF beta is administered. 48 hours later, we'll collect the supernatants and cell lysates uh, to assess different, different endpoints uh, for this assay. So the specific endpoints we look at are protein levels for pro-collagen type 1C peptide, as well as plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, uh, which are factors that are upstream of uh, collagen and fibronectin production. Uh, additionally, we'll look at levels of alpha methyl actin and a number of qPCR markers uh, that are kind of based on client interest. So as you can see, uh, with TGF beta treatment in these cells, we see increased PIP and PAI1, as well as alpha smooth muscle actin and relaxin, which is used as a positive control in this compound, uh, will cause decreases in these, uh, these markers. So in summary of the pulmonary fibrosis models, uh, today we presented two clinically relevant uh, models, both IT and osmotic pump uh, models. I didn't present any data with the radiation-induced model, but those can be found on the Biomodels website if, if there's any interest there. The validation of these models, we showed in induction of inflammation, increased lung weights, and then fibrosis by both histology and collagen detection, as well as uh, changes in lung function. Also showed that two positive controls, profenadone and a uh, anti TGF beta antibody, uh, can be used uh, as clinical comparators in this model, um, as well as briefly touching on a screening tool for antifibrotic compounds in a in vitro fibrosis assay using TGF beta stimulated normal human lung fibroblasts. 
Thank you for your attention today. And I just have a few acknowledgments. Our managing partner, Dan Lickman, our Chief Scientific Officer, Stephen Sonis, our Chief Operating Officer, Greg Ling. I'd also like to thank our scientific, technical, and business administration staffs. And I welcome any questions by email, and I'm happy to provide my email address for any, any follow-ups. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Borkowski. We do have a good number of questions that have come in during your presentation, so I will plan on forwarding those along to you. And for our folks who sent those questions, you can watch your email for answers to those questions. So on behalf of our sponsor for today's event, Biomodels LLC, and Cambridge Health Tech Institute Global Web Symposia Series, I'd like to thank you all so very much for coming today and wish you a wonderful day and a great week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.